Christmas is a time when we get together and under normal circumstances with family and friends. Uh, this year was probably difficult. You may have missed out on some of that. But even in the best of times, um, Christmas never really lives up to expectations in a way. And I, I don't want to be a, a Grinch when I say that, but uh, there's a sense in which we have these grand plans and it's never quite what we think it'll be. Um, you have somewhere back in your mind some memories of what Christmas used to be. Somewhere in your life you had a pretty good Christmas, probably one at least, and you kind of think back of that and there's this um, vision of that stuck in our heads of, of Americana, of, of Norman Rockwell, and uh, the perfect Christmas, you know, with snow on the ground and everyone in their pajamas and flannel and the, the fire going in the fireplace, and it's all just right. And then we have Christmas, and it's, it's never exactly that. I don't know if it ever was, but it never does quite get back to that especially looking back as an adult. It's just never the same as it was when we were kids. Um, and that's kind of a weird sensation that we have at many times in our lives, that as you age and grow up, your relationship to family changes, your relationship to the past changes, familiar things um, become old things and you, you miss them, but you can't quite get them back. Why is it so difficult? to recapture the past? Why is it we can't just have that back? Why do things have to change? It seems like they do. Um, my little kids are in the beautiful moment of enjoying Christmas, but I can I can already tell when I look at them, they're, they're getting older, you know, every day and every month and every year. And I only get so many more of these magical moments with them. Uh, and then they're gone and then they're adults and things change. And I guess it had to have been the same way for my parents. Why are things, why do things have to change? Why is it so difficult to recapture the past? I think a passage that speaks to that while talking about a completely different topic, so it's going to be a while, but stay with me, is Galatians chapter 4, 1 through 7. It is a passage that talks about growing up and the significance of that. Verses 1 and 2 say, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave. Though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. So Paul's going to use an extended metaphor here, and he's asking us to imagine a child who's going to be the heir of the fortune, right? He's going to own it all. But when he's a child, he owns nothing. When he's a child, he is actually outranked by the head servant that the father puts in charge. And it's kind of a strange relationship, right? If you, if you can imagine one of these days, I'm going to grow up and be your boss, but right now you're in charge of me. Uh, that's the relationship between the small child who is the heir apparent and the servants that the father has put in charge of his life. But what we all understand is the child, even though someday he may own it all, is in charge of nothing right now. With apologies to young Bruce Wayne, the heir doesn't outrank the butler, right? Alfred wins. In, in real life, uh, the butler is in charge of the child, even though the child may someday own it all. That's the natural order of things. It's the way it's supposed to be. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Where are we going with this? Well, watch, watch what he does. In verse 3, in the same way we also... When we were children, we're enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. So what he's making is, is a comment here about humans and human civilization generally, that there is a reality to this that all of us experience, that human civilization, human culture, human people, human persons, all of us have to grow. We go through a growing process. And once we were enslaved. That's really negative language. But all it's not negative in the sense that you're thinking of negativity, I guess. Uh, slavery language in the Bible is not always as bad as you think it is. But it's the sense of you weren't in charge. You weren't in control of your own life and destiny. Somebody else had a say over you. 
And Paul includes himself in that as a, a Jewish man uh, speaking to an audience in Galatia that would have been both Jew and Gentile. In fact, that's a lot of the conversation in the, the book of Galatians is Jew and Gentile relationships and the relationship to their past. Uh, Paul says, yeah, we, we, not you guys, we, we Jewish people, we people like me, all of us were once under some other custodianship. He calls it here the elementary principles of the world, which is a super fun phrase to translate. Uh, if you look in the commentaries of translations, you get a wide, wild range of options of how to translate it. The NIV translates it, the elemental spiritual forces of the world. The New Living Translation says it's the basic spiritual principles of the world. ESV, which I just read, is the elementary principles of the world. And the Good News Translation says the ruling spirits of the universe. What in the world is Paul talking about? It's not immediately obvious, and it's one of those that I, I could be wrong. I mean, you, you end up picking one and saying, I think it's this. I'm not entirely sure, but here's the best I've got. Um, I don't think the spirit translation is the right way to go. Uh, I think it's the elements or rudiments or principles is the right way to think of this translation, uh, of this phrase when you translate it. And what I want you to think about is, again, growing up, because that's the metaphor. When you were a child, you learned how to read. Okay. My son, Lucas, is older, and he's reading Harry Potter books. And he loves to read uh, young adult fiction, okay? And it's you know, chapter books. My youngest son, Calvin, is five. He's in kindergarten. He's learning to read. And he's learning to read the same way you learn to read, see, spot, run, right? <laughs> you get these little books with... Um, Hop on pop and, you know, three word sentences, preferably that rhyme. You get really rudimentary language. And it's really hard to tell a good story with those words, but that's all he's got to work with. Very simple grammar, very simple vocabulary, very simple stories. And that's how you start out teaching a child to read. And I think what Paul is saying is both Jew and Gentile in their history, in their heritage, began with moral and spiritual guidance. God didn't abandon us. God didn't just throw us out here as orphans and say, good luck with that. He gave us guidance. And then at times we chose guidance for ourselves. And all of us were under kind of moral caretakers that showed us how to live. The, the C-spot run, the, the basic grammar primer of our lives was back there. Some of those were good, helpful. Some of them uh, really made a difference and helped us to be who we're supposed to be. So for example, for the Jewish person, they had the law of Moses, which if you just back up a couple of verses, we're in Galatians 4, but if you back up to Galatians 3, 23 through 25, he says specifically to the Jewish person, now before faith came, we, again, speaking of Jews, we were held captive under the law imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that the faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ you are all sons of God through faith. Paul says, I had a guardian. Uh, this word guardian is just exactly the kind of thing we're thinking of here. Uh, the Greek term, patagagos, um, I may not be saying that right. I always put the emphasis on the wrong syllable there, but it's the, the idea, it's a compound word that means a child leader. Uh, it's a tutor, a guide, a, a moral caretaker. Someone taught Paul how to live, and that someone was the law of Moses. It taught him what was right and wrong. It showed him um, how to live a moral, decent life and how to approach God and lots of other things he couldn't have known any other way. The Gentile now was never given that law. But even the Gentile had guidance by the moral principles that were parallel to that law. Romans chapter 2, 14 through 16 says it this way, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men 
by Christ Jesus. The Gentile never was given the law of Moses. They weren't there that day at Mount Sinai. They weren't handed the, the law of Moses from their parents and their grandparents, and they weren't taught that. And I don't think they were supposed to be. There was an accommodation made for them, even in the law of Moses. When visitors visited a city, you treated them a certain way. But at the same time, they it was understood they aren't us, and they don't keep this law, and we know this about them. At the same time, there were some precepts, what we might think of as moral principles of the law, that did exist in Gentile culture. So, for example, maybe a Jewish person um, kept Sabbath and a Gentile would have never, it never would have occurred to a Gentile to keep Sabbath. But at the same time, in virtually every culture, murder is a bad idea. There aren't a lot of cultures out there. We may find ways to excuse it. Certainly we do. But murder, just in general, bad idea. Okay, Gentiles knew that. Even without the Ten Commandments, the Law of Moses, or a word of Leviticus, they knew rape bad, right? They got that. And so Paul says, yeah, you did by nature, by natural law, by natural theology is the technical term, by kind of looking at the universe, listening to it, to hearing God's voice and providence, even without the specific Law of Moses to guide you, you did get some moral guidance, okay? And that was good. Good for you. Um, catch is, while some of the guides to living were good, some of them were destructive, okay? So specifically for the Gentiles, going back again to Galatians and skipping down a few verses now from our text, in verses 8 and 9, he says, formerly when you, now see the difference, when he's talking before, he says, we, we Jewish people, now he says, you, Gentile people, you did not know God. You were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to be once more? So before he said we were under some elementary principles, he says you also were under some elementary principles, and again, they weren't always helpful to you. Sometimes your tutor was asleep at the wheel. Uh, and certainly we see that in ancient pagan life, that there were situations where they didn't get the moral guidance they needed. Colossians 2 and verse 8 uses very similar language to describe the plight of the Gentiles in saying, See to it that no one takes you captive, in same language, by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to, and here's that phrase again, the elemental spirits of the world, or what I'm translating it as, the elementary principles, the sea spot run of the world, and not according to Christ. He said, don't go back to that, because that wasn't helping you. There were parts and elements of the life you live that were not good, empty deceits. And to put a bow on it and kind of wrap it all up, he then summarizes this point he's making in Galatians, also in Colossians, verses 16 through 19, speaking again both to Jewish and Gentile concerns. Look at what he does. In verse 16, Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Okay, what's the background of the Jewish faith? And he describes it with the Sabbaths and the laws and the festivals. He says, even though, good as they were, were shadows of the real thing to come. The real thing is Jesus Christ. He says, now for the Gentile, watch as he pivots, let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together with its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. See, he really addresses both groups. For those of you that were following the law of Moses, he says, remember that that was supposed to point us to Christ. That was the goal. For those of you that have been doing some other stuff, and he describes it with you know, various terminology, worshiping angels and asceticism and visions and who knows what you pagans are up to, he says, remember that those things uh, were not leading you to Christ and not helpful. But in both cases, the goal is to move from what you had and move to Christ. If you were the under the law, he says it's time to come find Christ. If you were not under the law and were doing what Gentiles do, time to come find Christ. Which again, I think is his point back in Galatians chapter 4. In Christ, we are being led into maturity. It's time to grow up. 
It's time to be who God has made us to be. Without Christ, we can't be that. It doesn't matter whether you are following the law or some wild pagan system. Neither one made you who you were supposed to be. Only Christ accomplishes that. So in verses 4 through 5 of Galatians, back in our text in chapter 4, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive redemption as sons. And there I think, again, the law is a reference to the law of Moses, that Jesus was born into that system. But he was born to be the son who would show us what it means to grow up. He was born under the law, but he was coming to redeem those under the law. He was there to show us what it means to grow into maturity and even to receive the adoptions of people we'd never thought would be our brothers and sisters before. Uh, the Gentiles that he's going to speak of in the following verses. When the world was made ready, we'd been under custodians until now, some good and some bad. But when the world was made ready, God sent his true heir, the perfect and faithful guide, into human maturity. Not only did he send us the heir, he sent us his spirit. In verse 6, And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So how is God the Father drawing us into a more mature relationship with himself? By sending us the Son, who walks along beside us and goes ahead of us and shows us how to have a mature relationship with the Father. And he sends us his Spirit, who works within us to help us to have a right relationship with the Father. Uh, this is what Paul says also in Romans eight fourteen through 17. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. See, we're not going backwards. He says, no, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we also may be glorified with him. The Spirit has taught us from within how to grow into the right relationship with the Father and how to mature that relationship. You may have had some semblance of a relationship before. God didn't leave us as orphans. But before, we had a relationship with the Father that little children have. Now we get to have the relationship with the Father that grown-ups have, a mature relationship, an adult relationship. And it's changing, and it requires us to grow into that relationship. The phrase Abba, uh, is, is kind of an Aramaic term. Um, I think some commentators will say it means daddy or something like that. I think that's probably not the point. Um, but dad, maybe. I mean, the point is it's a, it's a more familiar term that I get to speak to my father in a more familiar way. When I was a child, I knew my father the way a child knows his father. As an adult, I now know my father the way an adult knows my father. And that relationship is different. It's not less, it's more. That's the goal. And that's what God is calling us into. The Spirit draws us into a deeper and more mature relationship with God. So what's the big point here? Our original question, I know it seems like I left it behind, talking about Christmas and, and family get-togethers and how you can't, it seems like you never go home again, never is the same. Uh, what's the point? Why, why is it so hard to recapture the past? Why do we have to change? Why do relationships change? And the answer is actually that because being human means growing up. That's the point. We are creatures that change. We are not static beings or entities, rocks that sit on the shelf and never change the way they look or they are. We are creatures made to change, made to grow and to be more as we change, not less. And so there's an opportunity, if, if we can just set nostalgia aside in our human relationships, to let those relationships grow and change and actually become deeper with time. If we don't get caught up romanticizing the past, we can have more meaningful relationships if we dare to, if we grow up as humans do. 
Being a Christian means growing in Christ. That as the years pass, humanity is being called into a deeper knowledge of the Father, deeper relationship with God, into something we never could have had before made possible by Jesus Christ. The application then of this lesson is now act like it. If we are the people who God has called into adulthood in his son, we're no longer the petulant child heir who, who acted so childishly. No, we are the grown-ups now in Christ Jesus. He died to help us grow, to lead us into something new. Well, now we have to act like it. We spend a lot of time not acting like it. We spend a lot of time acting like children. And then we lament that what things aren't the way they used to be. See, we still want to be children. Grow up. It's time to grow up and to be something that God has always intended for us to be, mature and complete in him. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your grace and your love and your patience. That while we were children, you did not leave us as orphans to fend for ourselves, but gave us a means by which we could grow into you. Help us now to follow Jesus Christ into maturity and to be the people you would have us to be. And in his name we pray. Amen.